Thanks for joining us today. This is another great 30 minutes of Point of View. I'm Pastor Josh Barnes, and this is my brother, Justin Barnes. And this is the show where we're unashamed to look at political issues from a biblical point of view because Jesus rose from the dead and he said the Bible's true. And if the Bible is true, then it should be the foundation by which we arrive at our conclusions about everything. And uh, so that's what the show is all about, worldview and applying the biblical worldview to issues. Justin has our issue for today. Justin, what are we talking about today? Well, <clears throat> there was quite the kerfuffle this past week with the uh, Journal of Medical Ethics, which that might imply to you that there's going to be ethical standards uh, in medical practice. But unfortunately, this was kind of a, a post from the Journal of Medical Ethics, a very short one, that caught a lot of attention uh, because it was basically saying we're not ethical. But we'll get to that in a minute. Um, like I said, it caught a lot of attention, but it caught a lot of attention, I think, for one of the atrocities that it talks about, but not all of them. So I, I think it's worth going over, even if you've already heard about this, because there's more to this than people are letting on. And I think it comes out if you actually read what the article says. So I'm going to read this. It's from the Journal of Medical Ethics, like I said. It, it's called LGBT Testimony and the Limits of Trust. Um, here's what it says. In Forever Young, the Ethics of Ongoing Puberty Suppression, OPS, for Non-Binary Adults, Notini et al., which I'm, I'm guessing is a person's name. I don't know what nationality that may be, or perhaps a an organization that I, I don't know. But Notini et al. discusses the risks, harms, and benefits of treating non-binary patients via identity-affirming OPS. Now, you may have heard there that they're talking about non-binary adults. And sure, that sounds good. Um, at least we're not talking about the children. But as we're going to see in a minute, they definitely mean this for the kids too. Um, you may, you may not um, be familiar with this, or you may be, depending on how in, engaged in this particular discussion you are. But there's definitely a huge movement of people, and apparently now a journal of medical ethics, who are pushing for young children to be able to be transed, for lack of a better term. By the way, one of these people would be running for governor in California by the name of Caitlyn Jenner, which that's a whole nother kerfuffle that we're not going to get into. But it says the ongoing puberty suppression. That's a pretty nice way of putting chemical castration in a lot of ways. Because a lot of these drugs sometimes for um, transitioning men to women, for example, would be the drugs that they give criminals to chemically castrate them. And yet that's also what we're going to give to kids and all these other people to suppress their puberty. Because the fact of the matter is, if you let their bodies do its natural thing, then their body is going to progress in a certain way and go through pu puberty. So we're wanting to suppress that. Well, here's what they say. Um, they discuss the risks, harms, and benefits of treating non-binary patients via identity-affirming OPS. Notini et al.'s article makes a strong case for OPS's permissibility, and their conclusion will not be disputed here. So they're already saying, we're not going to dispute uh, letting, this, letting this happen. But it says this. Instead, I directly focus on issues that their article addressed only indirectly. This article will use a hypothetical case study to show that while Notini et al.'s ethical conclusion might be spot on, that perhaps the method they took to get there was superfluous. But hear this sentence. If the medical community is to take LGBT testimony seriously, as they should, then it is no longer a job, the job of the physician to do their own weighing of the costs and benefits of trans, transition-related care. Well, that was quite the sentence. Let's, let's walk through this, shall we? If the medical community is to take LGBT testimony seriously, what do they mean by that? What they mean is that when a person comes in and says, hey, doctor, uh, I'm a guy, but I feel like a woman. The doctor is supposed to, nowadays, 
say, okay, when do you want to start treatment? When do you want to become a woman, sir, ma'am, it, it, you, sir, I don't know. When, when do you want to start? Because if you, if you know the, the book that was going around, um, making the rounds and still pretty popular, Abigail Schreier's book, Irreversible Damage, what she discusses there, and, and as I've heard her discuss in many interviews that she's given, is that the standard of treatment in the medical community these days for people who come in with gender dysphoria is affirmative treatment. Because of all the pressures coming down on them, basically you accept self-diagnosis in this one particular field. Which, by the way, how did this become medical? How did, how did this become considered a medical science? What other field can someone walk in and say, hey, doctor, um, tell you what, I don't need you to examine my eyes. Just do the, do the laser surgery. Yeah, yeah you, you, trust me, something's wrong with my eyes. I need you to do the laser surgery. What doctor would just do it? The, the guy would go, no, we, we need to look at your eyes to figure out what's wrong. And, and perhaps that's not even the correct treatment for you. Um, just because you don't feel like your vision's perfect doesn't mean we're putting you under the, the, the laser surgery. Or what, what guy walks into an orthodontist and says, doctor, uh, I need braces. Put, put some braces on me. Well, the doctor will go, okay, yeah, uh, let's take a look at your mouth. No, 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 no. Don't look at my mouth. You, you don't get to question. I, you don't get to question me, sir. You get to affirm my conclusions that I'm telling you. Give me braces. Put braces on me. I need this procedure. And go on down the line. This is the only place where we're saying a medical professional is able to just take them at their word. They get to self-diagnose. And by the way, this is even worse when you apply it to kids, like they're going to in a minute. This gets even worse when you apply it to kids because... If, if, if Billy comes in and says, doctor, um, I, I'm a girl, the doctor should say, but won't these days, the doctor should say, well, Billy, what makes you think that you're a girl? And that would be kind of the end of it right there. Because Billy would probably say, well, mommy told me uh, when I was playing with a dolly that that might mean that I'm a girl. So I'm a girl. It's absurd that they're saying that if the medical community is to take LGBT testimony seriously, you shouldn't. You went to college for however many years to get your doctorate in whatever field. Why are you allowing people to self-diagnose themselves? Which is kind of redundant, but whatever. And especially kids. Especially if you ask a boy, hey, Billy, what do you mean that you're a girl? Could you tell me what a girl is? Billy would say something like, well, um, my sister has a dollhouse and uh, I want to play with it because I think my G.I. Joes would, would be really cool to play with in, my, in her dollhouse. And she has this pink car. Uh, I want to play with the pink car. And, um, and, and yeah. That's what Billy is going to say. Why? He has no concept of what a girl actually is. And in order to get there from here, to say, no, 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 um, they actually can decide their gender, whatever age they are, you have to basically operate 100% on stereotype. What do I mean? Okay, uh, if any guy says that I'm a girl, what is he saying? He's saying, okay, um, I like wearing makeup. I like wearing dresses. I like to have parts of my body uh, not actually be parts that would be equated, would be associated with the female body, but I want them to look like it. Um, I want to wear generally girls' clothes and, you know, I maybe like sappy movies, um, you know, that sort of thing. What, what are you doing? You're, you're stereotyping women. Are you really trying to tell me that's what it means to be a woman? It is that shallow. Just the clothes you wear and makeup and, and some preferences for, for emotional stuff. Is that really what it means to be a woman to you? See, this is why I, I don't listen to anybody from that side of the aisle um, who tries to tell me that Christians are bigoted because women can't hold certain offices. I'm sorry. You, you can't enter this conversation. Not allowed. Not going not gonna to let you enter. 
because you think a woman is nothing except for a few stereotypes at best. But they say, if the medical community is to take LGBT testimony seriously, as they should, then it is no longer the job of the physicians to do their own weighing of the costs and benefits of transition-related care. Again, name me a field outside of this where that's the case. Doctor, my tooth is, is a little weird. Well, I tell you, if you want to cut the tooth out, you just let me know. What, should, should I cut the tooth? I'm not allowed to weigh the costs and benefits here. Um, <laughs> you're on. I, I can't tell you if this is good for you or not. Uh, let's catch up, see what happens. Your, your choice. You're the, you're the one that gets to weigh those. Really? Is that, is that what we're going to call medical care nowadays? They're not allowed to weigh the costs and benefits. There's there's a guy I, I follow who um, doesn't know me from Adam because he's kind of famous. Uh, the One of the best professional uh, players of a particular game that I like to watch. And he has a, a small tumor in his wrist. And uh, it's been kind of annoying him because he uses his hand a lot for the mouse. But you know what he hasn't been able to do? Just tell the doctor, cut it out. Uh, I'll weigh the cost benefits. He's actually been listening to the doctor who says, you know, I don't think this is worth it for you to, to, to get surgery. That's what actual medical professionals do. They say, hey, here's the care, but here's the cost of the care, not just financial, but what it's going to do to you physically. Uh, we need to weigh that. We need to we need to see if that's worth it for you. So they're saying, hey, just uh, believe any LGBT person about their diagnosis and their treatment. You don't get to you don't get to uh, <laughs> to advise them on that. It's crazy. Moving on. Assuming the patient is informed and competent, then only the patient can make this assessment because only the patient has access to the true weight of transition-related benefits. Except for if you look at the numbers pre- and post-surgery, the suicide rate for transitioning is still absolutely enormously high. Astronomically high. I think it's around 40% of people who are gender dysphoric, to use the, the more techie term, are suicidal before and after the surgery. So please uh, tell me what the benefit was. Doesn't seem to have helped. Not that they care. But then, but then there's this. And this is the worst sentence that makes all of this so much worse. Moreover, taking LGBT patient testimony seriously also means that parents should lose veto power over most transition-related pediatric care. So they're arguing that if you're a parent and little Johnny... Um, has told the doctor that, um, well, actually, I'm, I'm Susie now. Even though Johnny has no concept of what a, what a Susie is, as opposed to what a Johnny is. No concept. The, the Journal of Medical Ethics is arguing that parents should not be able to say no. They should lose veto power. In other words, the state wants you to not be allowed to raise your own kids. By the way, we see this in a lot of different areas, right? So why why else are we trying to add another four years to school? Well, actually, if, depending on if Biden can do math or not, because he said a few different numbers, two, four, three. Um, but why, why are they trying to add years to how many years of school the government gets your kids? Because then they get to own them. They get to raise them. They get to make them whatever they want them to be. They don't trust you to raise your kids. And if, the, if your kids are sold out to, the, to their ideology, you have no right to stop them from being good little uh, radical leftists or Caitlyn Jenner, who somehow is being sold as a conservative. That's, that's what we're dealing with. But, but here's the point, and I'm going to say this, and I want to bring Josh back in. My problem here is that the outrage was only over the fact that parents should lose veto power. That is an outrage. Should you, there should be backlash for that. But how about the fact that they're arguing, even though they say adults at the beginning, they're clearly arguing transition-related pediatric care. These are people who are arguing for open season on transitioning 
young children. It's it's that's bad enough. That that right there, that is unethical. That's good enough to lose you the Journal of Medical Ethics title. Not to mention, I mean, it's so far down the road saying parents can't veto that. That sure. Okay, yeah, that's nuts, but it's nuts just saying a kid can transition or should have that option or should be even presented with that the framing of a worldview that would allow that to enter the conversation. That is so, so beyond logical, rational, and most importantly, biblical, that this should never enter the conversation. So I'm concerned, frankly, that the, the outrage has been only well, you're saying parents can't veto it. That's bad. Terribly bad, especially when you have conservative parents who say, no, I don't want my kids raised by the government and raised in that ideology. But it's even worse that they're saying, yeah, do this to kids. Mutilate their bodies irreversibly. Give them chemicals that will wreck them. That is the real outrage. And also that parents can't veto. That is what the Journal of Medical Ethics is arguing for. And with that, I want to bring Josh back in because I've had enough of a rant and I, um, I'm sure Josh is going to, to very much so not, not support my position on this one. Josh, what are your thoughts on this little <laughs> gem? Um, well, you're, I, I can't even believe this. I can't, it's really shocking to me that this is actually what's, I mean, I, I guess I, it's not shocking it's the the direction it's going, but this is so blatant. It is right out in the open. It is, it's crazy. It's it's insane. I mean, here they're literally saying taking LGBT patient testimony seriously means parents should lose veto power. So they're saying anyone who claims that they're trans should get whatever they say they want. This is just bad. This is really bad for people. Okay, let's let's set aside for just a moment because we won't set it aside forever. Let's set aside our biblical worldview just for a moment. Um, or at least the part of it that teaches us that God created men and women. And let's just for a second set aside the fact that it's not even true that someone who feels like a woman is a woman, right? They're either a woman or a man based on their biology. So let's set aside those, the facts about actual truth and the, the biblical worldview, which I think are huge, big, important facts, the main reasons why we want to avoid this. But just saying that whatever somebody thinks about themselves, whatever they ask for, should be given to them. That just is, especially medically speaking, that's really dumb. And then you increase the dumbness, the idio idiocy, and say that children, children, whatever a child asks for in surgery, a doctor has to give them. That's insane. That's not dumb. That's insane and it's endangering our children. And what about the freedom of a doctor to say no to this? What about the liberty? You say, well, they have the right to, to get whatever surgery they want. Well, what about the, the liberty, the rights of the doctor to say, this is bad. I don't want to participate in doing harmful things to people's bodies. Like, where does that freedom come go? Yeah, I mean, you raised a fair point because this has externalities as an issue. Uh, we've seen, um, for example, there's already people pushing for the for bills mandating that doctors. I think it's more in Canada and other places right now, but I think there is talk of it in America too. People pushing for bills that ban doctors from rejecting doing these kind of surgeries. So if you're a man who, um, or, or, or a woman, if you're a doctor who performs mastectomies on women when it is medically necessary, well, now you have to do it on women who feel like they're men. Um, 
and we've seen this happen in other areas. So don't think this is crazy. So a guy owns a bakery shop and because of his religion, he doesn't want to bake a cake for a homosexual wedding. Well, now we've got to sue him like 400,000 times because we can't let someone be a professional in their field and not accept our ideology. We can't let them stand on the principles they want to live their life by. So if you don't think this is coming for doctors, you're out of your mind. But that that is sort of, um, that, that's, that's one more issue on this just giant heaping problem of immorality and unethical action that says that that can justify the idea of doing this to kids. I mean, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, didn't we? About why is it always that kids get victimized in, in, in cultures that are just eating themselves alive? And we're seeing it again. And the Journal of Medical Ethics is doing it. It's, it's, it's crazy to me. Yeah, you know, and this from the this from the the party that or and from the people who say that they're the party of science, they're they're on the side of science, but they're denying the scientists, the doctors who know their field, from being able to even advise, let alone have any sort of say in the procedures that they undertake. This is this is very dangerous. This is danger. Okay, so. When it comes to science, let's 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 put up those two arguments, right? There's the there's the left that says science says that man is causing global warming. We've got to do the Green New Deal to fix it. Actually, science doesn't say that. Science actually has proven that the globe happens to be warming, but we can't prove that it's man doing it or that we can even that we could even start to fix it. Um, but they say that, okay, if they were right, and if that's what scientists were really saying, and that was really going to happen, then they, they say, well, it's dangerous for us not to do this. We're actually going to hurt people and hurt people. Take that same logic and apply it to actual things that are actually provable that we know damage, we know hurt people, especially people like I, I, I've got the statistics somewhere and I didn't, didn't have it for today because I didn't know we were going to cover this, but it's something in the neighborhood. It, it's above 50% of trans people regret their decision and have a, and go for a reversion surgery later. And this really hurts them. I believe I, I, now I'll have to check that number, but I believe it's over 50%. I believe it's staggeringly high. And these people are being damaged by this and actual scientists and actual, you know, counselors should be counseling people like this. They have mental problems in their head where they think they are different than what they are. Someone who says, I identify as a cat. You need serious counseling. You need serious, you need a psychologist. You need some help, right? That's what we used to say, boy, you need help. <laughs> now we can't say that anymore. No, no. You need to accept them no matter what they say. No, that's that's not helpful to that person. That person needs help. And this is actually dangerous to ignore these the actual science on this matter. Yeah, and, and a, a couple things to sort of piggyback off that. Um, number one, one of the big arguments is, well, you have to accept them for who they are. Yeah, that's the point. I'm trying to help them accept who they are because instead of let's mutilate your body so that your brain can maybe become more comfortable with the body you're in. How about we, we work on your brain to help it start being more comfortable with the body that you have that is functioning exactly how it's supposed to. Um, so if we're arguing from accept who they are, yeah, I agree. And who they are is, deeply rooted in science. But another thing that you were saying concerning um, all of these these medical fields, I mean, again, we went over, what other field can you do this in? But, but it's even worse than that in that the danger when it comes to kids, especially with this affirmative therapy thing, is kids going through puberty or kids that are, you know, under a lot of peer pressure, all that sort of stuff. All they say is something that sounds kind of like I may be uncomfortable in my body. 
And the doctor immediately, because of the immense pressure they are under, says, well, you might be the other gender. That's it. Yeah. It's yeah, crazy. And I'm I'm tr by the way, just so everyone knows, I'm trying to find the statistic. I may be way off. I'm trying to remember because we did this subject uh, about a month ago. I might be way off. It might be. It might well, be one like one relevant statistic that that is uh, similar but way way higher than than the number you cited is that of kids that experience gender dysphoria, if they're not given affirmative treatment and care and transition and all that sort of stuff, they have a ninety some odd percent. Uh, getting over it right. I forget exactly what the, the terminology is, but 97% percent of them grow out of it. However, if they are given affirmative treatment and care and all that sort of stuff, they none of them do. Yeah. So we're talking 90 some odd percent of these kids who you're going to block their puberty, wreck their body, maybe even cut them to pieces, 90 some odd percent of them would have grown out of it. 90 this, this is, we're saying you are only right 10% of the time, and even that 10%, your whole worldview's messed up. But but 90 some odd percent of these kids will grow out of it. And yeah. yet, the this article is arguing parents should not be able to say, you know what, I don't think my kid's in the 10% or yeah. less. If you want to, if you want to find out the real number, I don't remember what it was, but you can go to the the show we did on the 60 Minutes special because the 60 minute 60 Minutes put out a special on this issue and they actually cited the 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 number and I, I can't remember what it was but it was incredibly high and they wanted to the, in the 60 minutes special they actually mentioned even though it was pro trans the whole special they said well maybe some people should be sort of counseled ahead of time and sort of maybe thought through this ahead of time before they just jump into this as a solution to their problems because a lot of people will say well i don't feel right something's missing gotta change my gender and that's totally wrong in 60 minutes even though they were pro trans said that's the wrong reason to do it there's no right reason actually to do it but that so check out that that article there that that show that we did on on the 60 minutes issue um but that's just about all the time justin do you have one more thought real quick we have no I, I know we're coming down to the wire here i could rant on this one all day i just think it's awful what we're everything about this article is just awful yeah you're absolutely and right. unethical by the way yeah you're absolutely right. It is awful. It is unethical. Guys, we want you to be right about issues. To be right about issues, you got to have to be biblical, which is why we're trying to bring the biblical point of view, the biblical worldview to bear on these issues. And when scripture speaks on transgender, it's, it's very simple. God created them male and female, period, end of conversation. There's really not a whole lot, you, a study you need to do. That's it. So um, that's pretty simple. Guys, we want also want you to know and believe the gospel. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We must repent and trust him by faith. And we want you to tell your friends and family about Point of View. Thank you guys for doing that. Don't forget to like us and subscribe on, on YouTube. We'll see you next time right here on Point of View.